Jesus, believing on Jesus, safe and secure from all the Lord. We need Jesus, we need Jesus, I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. for that name and demons tremble somebody say amen hallelujah thank you thank you jesus
seated tonight. I am appreciative of the reminder we received on Sunday. God is still in control and the difference between God and all these other little gods of the world is I'm thankful that even though he died, he rose again and is in, in control today of what is taking place in our world. And uh, if you doubt that we are in the end times, uh, you need to read a little bit and understand because even here in the state of Tennessee, we had two earthquakes this morning right here in Tennessee. And, uh, uh, you know, we're not actually too far from an area where they say is a fault line. Now, it didn't happen there. It actually happened up in the eastern part of the state where uh, I don't think they were really expecting a whole lot today. And uh, up in that part of the state, they got snow on the ground and earthquakes all at the same time. And uh, it's just it's something else I saw where Kingsport... Uh, had eight inches of snow on the ground. It was still coming. And uh, my goodness gracious, better them than us, isn't it? I tell you, it kind of comes with that territory being in that elevation. And uh, saw where uh, the church there in Kingsport is actually having a church online tonight. And uh, saw where Brother Dainsworth was trying to get him some Krispy Kreme donuts today. Couldn't get them. The line was all the way out. Krispy Kreme, yeah, Brother Dainsworth is now the pastor there in Kingsport. And uh, Krispy Kreme was running, you buy a, do a dozen donuts and you got the second dozen for a dollar. So they were wrapped up all day long today. And uh, he had said he wasn't going to go down there. Well, then when they had to cancel church tonight, 
he was probably needing a little something to get him to church time and be able to get in there. And so he was in the Krispy Kreme line and did a Facebook Live showing all the people that was there. Lined up out the door, all the way around the building. It was something else. But uh, I said all that to say, you know, they're experiencing things even in the eastern part of the state and showing that it is the end times. We have to understand that how we got here um, is, is very crucial in where it all started. Yes, it started with Adam and Eve. But the road back to where we needed to be started when Jesus was born. And so we are going to go there tonight. We have finished up our holiness series last week. We wrapped that up. And so for the next couple of weeks, we are going to focus on Christmas, even in our Wednesday night uh, messages. And if you would, and uh, we're not going to go there right off, but if you want to tonight and you want to turn in a Bible, we're going to Luke, the second chapter, a very familiar passage of Scripture. When we say Christmas, I remember, Brother McCoy, this was the chapter that Dad would read from every year before we opened gifts. He loved Luke's account of the Christmas story. And so we could pretty much know we needed to come to the living room with Luke chapter 2 out because that's where, and he wouldn't just read it. Once we got old enough to read it ourselves, he, we would all read a verse and we'd go around the room and do it. So dad loved Luke chapter 2. And so dad, if you're watching tonight, I'm preaching from your passage tonight, Luke, the second chapter. And we're going to read the first seven verses in just a moment. But may I say that while we're thinking about Christmas and a holy night the night divine, uh, tragically, the next few days for many will be days of rushing around. I would not ask you to raise your hand tonight if you hadn't bought the first gift yet. There are people that have not even started Christmas shopping. Um, thankfully, uh, that is not the case in our house. Now we're having to guard the gifts that are wrapped to make sure the kids don't wrap, unwrap them for us. But, uh, you know, fighting the traffic in the department stores, oh, I, I, in, in about four or five more days... I will make my last planned trip to the columns and I will not go back until after Christmas because that intersection down there is something else. And then you add the construction to that. You talk about traffic. That's going to be one mess. And I know Sister Courtney's nodding because she's got to go down in there to work. So <laughs> that's not going to be fun. And, and so we have traffic in department stores. Um, your feet, you stand on your feet so long your feet start swelling because you're having to wait in lines and you're trying to get through the hustle and bustle of the season. Your head starts to hurt because of the weather change. And, and uh, add on top of that, your nerves just kind of seem like they get frayed about this time of year, don't they? And a uh, <laughs> little girl was reciting the Lord's Prayer and she meant to say, forgive us our trespasses, Brother Michael. And she said, forgive us our Christmases. And uh, I think... Uh, we probably could pray that prayer sometimes. The first Christmas, there was no room for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, there was no room for Him in the end. I, I, I'm afraid that today, for many, in Christmas, there's no room for Jesus Christ. And so I want to speak on this subject tonight, the crowded out Christ. The crowded out Christ. So let's go to Luke chapter 2. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. Tragic end to this verse, because there was no room for him in the end. For many people... The Christmas bells are the jingle of the cash register. The spirit of the King Midas takes over the spirit of the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that there may have been in this innkeeper's heart maybe just a little bit of coldness or callousness. The Bible says here in verse 5 that Mary was great with child. She was about to be delivered. I mean, would you say to a young man and his wife who's about to give birth to a child, we don't have room for you? Well, you might sit there and say, say tonight, 
Pastor, honestly, maybe he really didn't have any room. There was one room. If he was really feeling sorry for the couple, there was one room he could have gave them. Where was he going to sleep? Boy, it just got quiet, didn't it? It would have been a sacrifice, yes. But he had a room. But there was no room for him in the end. There's an old story about a man who came to a hotel and the man behind the desks, he said, well, then I'll take that room. He ain't coming. <laughs> My friend, there's always room if we want to make room. We'll make pallets in the floor to accommodate guests if we want them to stay with us. And yet there was no room for the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of us today, I mean, here, I, I don't know how old Mary was. The Bible doesn't tell us. She was pretty young. And, and according to scholars that I can find that they would be willing to guess, they're going to say she was about 18 or 19 years old. And they have their ways of trying to figure that out. And I'm not going to preach that as gospel truth tonight. But I will tell you that, that you know, there, there's a good chance. And, and, but we do know, according to Scripture, this was her firstborn child. She had never had a child. Matter of fact, the Scripture would refer to her as a virgin. She's away from home. Now, Sister McCoy, you know every girl wants her mom near, especially when she's having her first child. But Mary's mother is not here. There was no doctor there. There, there was no midwife as far as we can tell from the Bible story. There were not sanitary conditions. How, how would you like to give birth to a baby to your firstborn without your mother there and without a doctor there? And, 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 and poor Joseph, oh my. It was hard enough for me to be in a delivery room of a nice hospital in Jackson, Tennessee on both of my kids being born. But have you ever thought about Joseph, how helpless he must have felt? Maybe even how ashamed he felt that he couldn't provide better than what he was able to provide for Mary. And after all, this is the Christ child. And, and, and I've got her in a cave back here giving birth to the Savior of the world. There they are out there among the animals. You say a cave, well, a lot of historians believe it wasn't necessarily a barn like we would like to think. But it was, it definitely there was animals around because we know what a manger was and that's where the baby was laid. And so it wasn't the most sanitary conditions. Again, I, I want to say tonight, this is not by accident. It was not by incident that all of this happened. Everything was engineered by the Almighty God. The fact that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem would be prophesied centuries before the prophet Micah. Micah 5 and verse, uh, or by the prophet Micah, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose doings forth have been from old, from Everlasting. He's going to be a ruler in Israel. That is how that God would engineer all of this down to even the minutest, the smallest of details. And Caesar would even say all of the world is supposed to be registered and taxed. How else? Are you going to get each one of them to go to their home city or their hometown? God is orchestrating all of this. Millions of people are moving about in this Roman Empire that one verse of Scripture would be fulfilled. And again, I say it's not incidental or accidental that there was no room for the Lord Jesus Christ because there is a prophecy of the fact that the world never has had room for Him. However, Harvest Church, I want you to think about it, how that our world has, had, has never had room for Jesus. This world has always begrudged everything that Jesus had. Let's start. Let's go through the story. He pointed out that in Bethlehem, they begrudged him a place to be born and he had nowhere to lay his head. He pointed out that Herod begrudged him his kingly title and Herod sought to slay him. Nazareth begrudged him his fame. They were offended and they would say, is not this the carpenter's son? The Pharisees begrudged the Lord Jesus the power that was his and said, this man only cast out demons by the prince of demons, Beelzebub. 
Beelzebub. They begrudged the Lord Jesus his right to his father's house. And when he cleansed the temple, they said, by what authority do you do this? And the chief priest would begrudge the Lord Jesus the Sabbath over which he was the Lord. And when he healed the sick man that had the withered hand on the Sabbath day, they would begrudge him on that day and say, what are you doing? Who are you? Who do you think you are? They would begrudge him the worship that he received even from harlots and publicans and they would snarl at Jesus and say this man receives sinners and he eats with them. They begrudged him every time he would get happy and joyful. Every feast he went to they said oh he's a wine bibber and a glutton. They begrudged him the worship of a fallen woman Mary who would wash his feet with her tears and wipe them dry with her long black hair. They would criticize him for this. Judas begrudged him a broken box of ointment and said why was this waste happening? The Pharisees even begrudged the cries of little kids. I mean come on can't the kids even get involved and when they would cry Hosanna in the highest they would sneer while the children would worship Jesus. They begrudged him even an hour of prayer in the garden of Gethsemane for when he prayed and the sweat was as drops of blood upon his brow and they came in to disturb the Lord Jesus even in the hour of prayer with sticks and staves and swords to bind him and to carry him away. Oh, the begrudging him would not stop there. They would begrudge him of his garments and strip him naked when they would crucify him. They would begrudge him even his title, King of the Jews, and say, Pilate, you got to change your sign. And he would say, what has been written has already been written. And they would begrudge him even a drink of clean water and give him vinegar and gall to drink and he refused to take the sip and they even begrudged the the peace of death and would put a spear in his side and hang him upon a cross I'm here tonight to remind us everything that Jesus did they begrudged him and they still do it today and he had all power in his hand. I wish I was in an apostolic church tonight. They would try to say, he can't rule the hearts of men. There's nothing that this world hates more than the Lord Jesus Christ who was born of a virgin to save the entire world. They have begrudged him from the very beginning and they're not going to stop now. And so it is our job as his children to not begrudge him but to like the wise men, seek him and worship him. May I tell you, this world never has and never will have room for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now don't get the idea that if you honor Jesus, this world will honor you. Now having said that, I want to point out several things to you and make some applications tonight. First of all, I want you to learn this as we speak. There is no room for Jesus in this world's government. I'm talking about the worldly system of things. One world government ain't going to be of God. Well, you're more vocal than that when Dr. Baxter was up there. Come on. It's the Bible. God's not going to be in the one world government. I don't care what side of the aisle you fall on. Psalms chapter 2 in the Old Testament, look at verses 2 and 3. The kings of the earth set themselves. They're only worried about themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord. There are some nations that will never be on the Lord's side. Hint, they got the remnants of Ishmael. And guess what? They'll even go against his anointed. You know what that means? They're going to turn and they're going to oppose Israel. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The rulers of this world, the kings, the high potentates, they never have had room for the Lord Jesus Christ. King Herod wanted to kill him. Friend, the world never has had room for him. The Jews of that day, when it was time for his crucifixion, were faced with fire. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And they said, we don't have a king but Caesar. What irony that they would choose the cruel yoke of Rome so that they could murder the man who had come to give them freedom. No room for Christ, but they had room for Caesar. The governments of this world have not changed. 
I was reading recently about the United States government was going to make a Christmas stamp. This is within the last year and a half to two years. They had actually tried to do this back, I believe the original, no, was back in 1989 or 1990 they was going to do this. And uh, the atheist kicked up and stopped it. So a couple of years ago, again, they were going to do this. And uh, they decided, we're going to make a Christmas stamp. And the post office had already designed the stamp. It was a wreath. A wreath. That's all. The wreath was in a window. There was a candle in the wreath. And somebody looked at the window and they said, I quote, You know, the window pane behind that wreath resembles a cross. We'll have to change the design of the entire stamp. Because the window resembled a cross. No room for the Lord Jesus Christ. We have secularized our society to where not only are we not only neutral, but we have antipathy toward the things of God. And I'm going to say it's not just in this country. I'm going to surprise you with something here. My heart was saddened as I was studying this out. There was a link in that illustration that I just gave you. There was a link to another illustration from the same time in 1990, Brother White. It was on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1990. It broke my heart to read it because I love the Jewish nation of Israel. And I'm, I'm a supporter of Israel. But there was a law passed on December 25th, 1990, that Messianic Jews, that is Jews that believe in Yeshua as their Messiah, Jesus, cannot immigrate into Israel and be accepted as automatic citizens. Other Jews can, but if you believe in Jesus the Messiah, you've got a long road ahead of you. In Israel, a Jew can believe almost anything except when you start really realizing who Jesus was. You can be an atheistic Jew. You can receive automatic citizenship. Or you can believe in the New Age philosophies. But you cannot believe in his deity. The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. Now, I'm also thankful that in the end times he's coming back to them again. And there's going to be a door of opportunity open for them again. But I'm just saying all of this to say this tonight. There is no room still today for Jesus Christ in government. Can I tell you, friend, there's no room for him even in, there's no room for him even in our educational institutions of our world. You go to today's universities. You go to today's public schools and you'll find they got room for evolution. We don't have any young kids in here tonight. They got room to talk sex ed. Hand out condoms. Not every school does that. But there won't be any outcry if they do that. But you let a teacher want to say something about God. And the wrong person kicks up about it. We got a problem in our country today. You'll find there's room for a study of the world's religions, Buddha. But they want to cut Christianity in our public schools. Now, thankfully, in the state of Tennessee, they just passed something that in every school they're supposed to put in God we trust. Thank God for that. That there are things that in our state, they're, they're trying their best, but not in some schools. The, the boys and girls, I even read of, of one school that there was a kid that wanted to have a Bible club and the school came down, I think it was in Omaha, the, the, the school came down and said it cannot happen on our property even if it's after school and student led. Now, I don't see how legally they can do that. And I think if they would have fought it a little harder, they probably would have won. I have heard even within the last three months of young people that come to this church write a paper on creation and get a failing grade because the teacher was against Christianity. There's no room for Jesus today in some of our education institutions. General Omar Bradley once said, we're living in a time where our achievements, our knowledge of science has gone far beyond our power to control it. We have too many men of science and too few men of God. Woo. We have brought about brilliance without wisdom and power without conscience. And then he said this, we are living in a time of nuclear giants and spiritual 
pygmies. No room for Jesus. Jeremiah prophesied. He said, for my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. Now I want to say again, there's room for everything but Jesus. We, we'll accept a lot of things, but not him. Somebody handed me not long ago, it was a magazine from the NEA. It's the National Education Association. And this issue was dealing with the subject of Halloween, and it was in the section called Human Rights. The article was entitled The Horrors of Halloween. Now, this is an old edition that they handed me. But they said, I wonder if this was published today, what would happen? They didn't believe that Halloween was horrible. As a matter of fact, the word horrors was in quotation marks in this teacher's magazine. The horrors of Halloween, and it was an article telling how to deal with parents who don't want to have witches and witchcraft and seances and all these matters discussed in public schools. And I'm going to read to you what the article said. Both right-wing and religious extremists have accused school employees of witchcraft for using magic circles as a teaching technique and have forced school libraries to remove books that discuss witches, have secured bans on textbooks concerning stories about violence or sorcery, in one case, have demanded that a school change its logo from a demon to something less sinister. Then in the article, the NEA said this, If confusion or hysteria hits your school this Halloween, what should you do? Stick together as a faculty and stay informed. Be watchful. Don't let any element in the community take your school captive and make decisions that are ours to make. In other words, don't let the parents tell you what to do. You, Mr. Teacher, teacher Madam Teacher, you are in control. And, and then there's this concluding and most chilling paragraph in the whole thing. Most important of all, they wrote, report all anti-Satanist activity immediately to your local association. It's your best defense against what's usually the real aim of such activity, and it's an attack on public education. It's not an attack on public education. We just want to guard the heart and minds of our children. Now, if you find any anti-Satanist, report it. Because that's an attack on public education. Can you imagine if we said report any anti-Christ activities, what would happen? So that tells me there's room for some things, but we don't want this religion stuff. Again, this is not every school, but there's a lot of this going on in our nation today. May I say, sadly enough, there's no room for Jesus even in this world's religion talked about government, I've talked about schools. Let me talk about the church right now. How many churches today are truly preaching the full deity of the Lord Jesus Christ? How many are preaching the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? How many are preaching the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ? It is to a religious world that the Lord Jesus is speaking in Revelation chapter 3 when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Quit using that scripture trying to win new people to the Lord. He's talking to people in the church. He says, if anybody will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. The picture is Jesus on the outside of a Laodicean church knocking on the door saying, would you just let me in? You got my name on your building. Let me in. Jesus is the crowded out Christ. He was born, my friend, in a stable or, or in, 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 in a, 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 a place where animals are held. He, my friend, was despised and he was rejected of men and nailed upon a cross, buried in a borrowed tomb. Can I say next that, that really there's very little room for the Lord Jesus in Christmas today? How many this Christmas season honestly will honor the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Do you know what will prevail in our city or cities across America? Drunkenness, adultery, and gluttony. Drunkenness, adultery, and gluttony. You know who stands to make the most profit? The distillers. <laughs> the most beautiful ads you will see today will be the beer ads on television. Oh, yeah, that horse driving through the snow. Isn't that pretty? Yeah, they're showing you something beautiful, but it ain't going to end beautiful. You got to give them credit. I'll tell you, the distillers today are looking forward to Christmas. If somebody who doesn't orderly, ordinarily drink, they'll drink at a Christmas party. What do they say? Well, after all, it's Christmas. You see, it's an excuse for drunkenness. 
What about the churches? Did you know at Christmas time in churches, there's generally a letdown in attendance? That's not why there's a letdown tonight, okay? We've got literally people and people and people that are sick tonight. There's generally a letdown at Christmas. Now, I am happy. I, I was, me and Dad was talking about this the other day, and uh, he, he was talking about it, and he, he, he said, yeah, he said, uh, I was kind of concerned about you not having church on Sunday night in December because... You know, in December, a lot of times the giving would go down. You, you've seen that as a secretary in the office, that sometimes December can be difficult and, and, and the giving would go down. I'm thankful the last three years, that's not been the case. We've been able to maintain steady because God has blessed us. And, and when we give, and our Christmas for Christ has stayed at $2,000 for three years in a row. And I'm excited about it. We've got 1,800 pledged and we're giving again on Sunday. And there's been some money already come in that wasn't pledged. So I believe we're going to hit that 2000 Mark again, and that is in the month of December. But normally in the church world now, you can talk to any denomination, and what they'll say is Christmas time offerings are down, attendance is down, and we can't get anybody to do evangelism in December. Who are the heroes of Christmas today? Tiny Tim, <laughs> Rudolph, and a jolly red faced man with whiskers. Those are the heroes, fictitious characters. Oh, there's some. They'll make a lot of the babe in the manger. The giddy crowd will dance around a manger, but nothing of the full deity of Christ, nothing of his lordship, nothing of the atonement of Christ, nothing of the saving power. There's no room, really, for Jesus at Christmas. The true Christmas tree is a cross, and... We understand that. In 1 Peter 2, 24, he said, He who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Well, what does all this mean to you? What does it mean to me? Can I suggest five things real quickly? Here they are. Listen to me this Christmas. Are you listening? Number one, if you would like to find Jesus this Christmas, you will find him, but you will find him where you always found him. Despised and rejected of men. Outside, not on the inside. Let me give you a verse of scripture. Hebrews 13, I'm going to read verses 12 and 13. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Because we have no continuing city unless we seek for him. Now what's that saying? It says that when Jesus Christ was crucified, they didn't even have the decency to crucify him inside town. They took him outside of the city. Now, some say on a garbage heap out, outside the city. And, and I've preached a message talking about the historical side of that. And the Bible says there in Hebrews, if you want to find him, you're going to have to be an outsider. Don't look for him inside the world system. You'll find him on the outside. Second point, second application. When you find him, to fellowship with him there. That's the second point. Don't just go find him and say, well, I found him. Spend some time with him. And here's what you're going to discover. You're going to discover the world that had no room for Jesus will have no room for you. Amen. You can write it down in bold capital letters. Look at the story of the prodigal. They liked him when he had the fun and the party. But when he ran out of the money, what happened? We ain't got time for you, Joker. Go feed some pigs. Go eat the slop. And finally he said, this ain't what it's all cracked up to be. I'm going back to my father's house. When you find the Lord, they're not going to have room for you. Now, when you find Jesus, you're going to find him on the outside. You're going to discover the same world that had no room for him will have no room for you. He said, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. I want you to look at John 15. Jesus said, I'm going to quickly read these verses, sister, verses 18 through 20. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. <laughs> Verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Verse 20. Remember the word I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. 
If they've persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And if they've kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Very clear, very plain, very simple. You can't go outside the camp without bearing his reproach. That's what the Bible says right there in, in John. Jesus died outside the city in Hebrews, it said. And the Bible said, let's go outside the city with him. And when we go outside to fellowship with him, then we will go out and bear his reproach. This vile world is not a friend of grace and it won't be a friend of yours. And the Bible says that friendship with this world is warfare with God. The third thing I want to say, not only must you go outside to find the Lord Jesus, and when I say outside, I'm talking about outside of the world's thinking now. But when you go outside to find the Lord Jesus, you're going to bear the reproach of Him. The third thing I want to say is when you go out there, you're going to find it's not bad. It's wonderful. Do we buy gifts at Christmas? Yes. Do we celebrate Christmas in our house and let kids unwrap presents? Of course we do. But... We are very careful that we don't make Christmas about that. That's why periodically throughout the year, when we can afford it, we will buy them a gift for no reason. Why? Because I want them to understand, Christmas needs to be more than just a special time where you get the new trinket. We've all heard the saying, it's not about the gifts under the tree, it's the gift that hung on the tree. I, that, but that can become a cliche to us and we don't really believe it. So we can get caught up in the rat race. You know what? The greatest liberty and freedom you're going to feel is when you really understand what Christmas is about. If, if the ribbon isn't just perfect, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to tell you something. We've tried to hide. There's one gift that I know I've hid four times. We just hadn't had time to wrap it yet, Brother Edward. And it's this, it's this ball and a basketball hoop that's going to stick on Matthew's door and he can shoot the ball. He loves playing ball, and I'm tired of picking up the ball in the living room. So I'm trying to hang a goal in his room so maybe he'll play in there with it. Yeah, yeah. So the goal will stay in there, but the ball will probably end up in the living room again, you know. Exactly, exactly. He has found that gift four times. I've put it in different places, and he has found that thing four times. It's not going to be a surprise. When he opens that gift, oh, that's where it is. Okay. But you know what? I didn't let that be the end of the world. Some people say, well, I'm going to take that back to Walmart. I'm going to take it back wherever I bought it. I hear you. It's, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. We've got to keep what is the reason for this season. If I'm going to spend, believe me, it don't matter how many gifts you put under that tree, you're going to have about 20 minutes max of fun. Then I need to spend at least equal amount of time with those kids telling them what this is about. I mean, all the way down to the point where I've told my daughter, because it got, at first I told her, I said, now listen, Santa Claus is not real. And we've had that conversation. And it got to the point where Brother White, she felt like she was Jesus' ambassador to go around and tell every kid Santa Claus wasn't real. And I had parents about ready to crucify me on our street sign out here because they was like, why is your kid coming to tell my kid there ain't so Santa Claus? I'm like, okay, Elise, hold on. Let's let you understand this. Santa Claus isn't real, but there are some people that play a game with it. So don't ruin it for those kids. Eventually, they're going to figure it out. Mom and Daddy bought them gifts. But don't you feel like you got to go and tell them that. However, if somebody asks you, you can answer that question. We were sitting in a business last year after I had had this long talk. Don't tell people. You just you wait. And a lady that leads a civic organization comes in. And she's like, oh, aren't you excited that Santa Claus is going to bring you something? And she just had no look of joy on her face at all. And she just kind of looks at her. Like, you're old enough to know better, ma'am. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, okay, lady, let it go, let it go. Just kind of, you know, Elise is the one. You, you start a conversation before you get on the elevator. Because there's no telling what she's going to bring up and say, you know. You just keep her talking. You control the conversation, you know. And I'm like, oh, lady, you're, you're asking for it. And I'm not going to call her down on you because you come over here begging for it. And finally she said, what do you think Santa's going to bring you? 
There was her window. And she said, Ma'am, Santa ain't real. I know better. I mean, you would have thought she shot the woman. She stepped back and she said, Oh, hun, just believe. And she just had to turn around and walk off. She didn't have nothing else to say. But just, oh, hun, just believe. And Elise laughed when the woman walked out. And she said, Dad, did she really not know better? That Santa ain't real. I was worried to death the other night downtown when they was making reindeer food that she was going to make a scene because she knew better. She knew better. But she's learned. She's learned. There's some people that make a game out of that. You know, even the Catholic Church is now going back on believing that there was even a Saint Nick in the Catholic Church. They're actually saying they've removed that from their new history book saying that they don't even know that the guy was real. But actually it goes back to a time where they worshipped a false god that his image was a jolly fat man that would bring gifts and would show up. So I'm very careful not to push something like that. Now, if she sees him out, just like when we went to Disney World, she knew Woody and Buzz Lightyear wasn't real, but she wanted her picture with them. She knew it wasn't real. So if she wants her picture taken with them, I don't care. She knows the truth behind it. It's somebody dressed up that's playing with them, that's, that's, that's playing a character or a role. I think we've got to be careful what we push in our world today because whether we mean to or not, we can actually crowd out Christ. Because if I lie to my kid about this, when I try to share them the truth, are they going to look at me and say, Dad, is this another game? Are you lying to me about this? I would hate to stand before God and God say, you know, your child would have probably went on and got the Holy Ghost if they would have believed this gift was real and where it came from. So I'm just throwing that out there as a tidbit for you. No, on that a little bit. Think about it. Prayerfully consider what we are pushing this time of year. That's why I wanted to clarify when we had all these gifts laying around that Sunday. I wanted to clarify what we were doing. I do believe that there are gifts that come from above. Every good, the Bible says, and perfect gift comes from above. And when you get the gift of the Holy Ghost, it opens up other gifts and how that God will bless us over and over again. I believe that we can use this time of year what, that the world is commercializing and we can turn that around and say, hey kids, you can actually learn that God does bless us and give us things in our lives. I'm running out of time. I'm going to hurry. There's plenty of room out there, number one. Number two, he's out there. And he'll turn that crib into a throne. He'll turn that cave into a palace. <laughs> don't ever feel sorry for yourself because you're an outsider and don't feel fit in. Can I just throw that in there right now? Don't, don't feel sorry for yourself because really the outsiders are the insiders. They're the ones that's with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It wasn't a whole crowd of people that came. I don't know how many wise men there were. Now, we did have to argue with Elise about this one the other night. She was about to tell me, there's three wise men. She was just tired of me telling her that there was not. And, and I said, look, hon. She probably went through this in Sunday school, too. It is a battle right now with her because there was three, three different kinds of gifts. So there was three wise men. Dad, you ain't going to tell me no. I said, look, hon. I don't know how many wise men there were. I don't believe it was hundreds of people because they couldn't get in Jesus' house if there was 100 people. But I don't know how many wise men there were. But I have to believe that the majority of people missed the sign. But there was a select group that noticed and they, even though they were an outsider, they actually were an insider because they found the Christ child. The fourth thing I want you to remember is this. I as a Christian and you as a Christian, just like the world has no room for him, we can have no room in our hearts for the world. We cannot love this world that has no room for Him. 
friendship with the world is warfare with God. How can I claim to be his follower and still make room for a worldly system that nailed him to a cross? The worldly Christian is a traitor to heaven's king. So the last thing I'll say is this, and Brother Cannon's come and help me close. The writer of the book of Hebrews said, when we go outside to bear his reproach, the Bible says we will see him and fellowship with him. And then it gives us this explanation. Was that in uh, Hebrew? See if it's Hebrews 13, verse 13, Sister Courtney. I did not put this reference in here. The Bible says we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I'm not sure. If it's not verse 13, we won't worry about it. It, it, it is in the Bible, and I, if I have to, I'll clarify Sunday where that is found. But he says, there it is. Let us go there for everything without the camp bearing his reproach. Go to verse 14. Maybe it's that next verse. If it's not, we're not going to. We're not going to worry with it. I'll, I'll find it and bring it back to you. But it talks about how that we're not looking for an earthly kingdom, but we're actually looking for a city that is to come. John caught a vision of a new Jerusalem. One day, there's going to be plenty of room for Jesus. And for everybody that will follow Him. For the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and His grace. Room for Jesus? There it is. Verse 14. Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. <laughs> you remember the prophecy, Brother Tim? The prophecy said, the government shall be upon his shoulders. And then it says, and to his government, there shall be no end. <laughs> So while I'm looking for a city, I know it's not a city that's made with hands. I'm looking for a city whose builder and whose maker is God. And so it's my responsibility to remember I'm not home yet. I'm really getting ready to date myself. Sister Teresa, you, you may remember when Stephen Curtis Chapman was at his highest. It was back when I was a teenager. Stephen Curtis Chapman, I mean, he was releasing a CD about every six months. That guy, his music was hot at that point. I remember buying CDs, uh, Speechless, and, and uh, I think it was one, Diving In, I think it was the title of one, and all this. Stuff. He wrote a song that I can hear it playing in my head right now. I'm not home yet. And he began to talk about how that we can't get so connected to this world that we start thinking this is all of heaven there's ever going to be. But i got to remember, he's went ahead to prepare a place for us. He said that where I am, there you may be also. And then he goes back and he says, I've got a little thing that you've got to do. You need to go to Jerusalem. And you need to wait for power to endue you from on high. You're, you're going to be filled with my spirit. And then you're going to be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in all Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And he begins to talk about his plan of building the church. And Peter, I'm going to build this church upon a rock. And it's not going to go anywhere because the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against this church. It's going to be a group of people that understand what life is all about. Paul would come and begin to plant churches and begin to work things in the church and begin to show them that there's a way for us to live. And we got to be careful, Paul would say, not to allow anything to have the mastery over us or to start controlling us. He's saying, don't crowd out Christ. Not just at Christmas, but in our daily lives. Let's don't schedule everything else and not schedule in time with Him. Charles, I found that if I don't put it on my schedule, I'm going to pray and read my Bible. It don't happen. I can have the best of intentions, but it's not going to happen if I don't put it down and say, this is the time that I'm laying my cell phone down and praying there's no emergency right now. Because I can talk myself into any number becoming an emergency. But saying, God, just honor this hour that I've got right now that I'm trying to give you 
And I'm not going to let my cell phone distract me. I'm not going to be sitting in front of a computer. I'm scared to even turn the radio on because I know all them songs and I catch myself singing to them instead of praying. I'm like, look, I can't even have the radio on. I've got to be able to focus on what I'm doing right now. I don't want anything to crowd out, God, this moment that I'm desiring to have with you. Would you stand with me tonight? We've got to be careful. Just like they crowded him out of Christmas, we can crowd him out. Not just of the Christmas holiday, not just out of our government, not just out of the educational system, not just out of the church, but in our daily lives. God, I want you to be a part. Not just a part. I want you to be at the center of it all. I, I want my life to revolve around you. I've had people tell me, aren't you worried your kid's going to hate church because they're all the time around church? No, I want them to understand our life is the church. We are the church. We're going to be doing things about church even when we're at home because God has done too much for us for us to think I don't need to give my all to Him. Lord Jesus, I thank You for this night that You've given us. I thank You for this